And good morning again. Again, I am Pastor Brian, and so glad you all could come out this morning. And and after a week like last week, I don't want to gloss over that without just kind of taking a step back and just doing a quick recap of last week. If you were here last week um, on on Sunday, wow. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, wow. Uh, Great weekend and and if you weren't here then I want to kind of give you an idea of what happened we uh, we had Saturday we had a service out of Hidden Valley right over here in Indiana right on the border and we had a baptism service out there and we had talked about it beforehand we let people know we, we uh, had 11 people said that they were interested in being baptized and so we went out there that morning with 11 people intending to walk out and commit their lives to Christ and be baptized wonderful thing uh, in the process of that, we had six more people that morning who stepped forward and were baptized and committed their life to Christ uh, in a public way. And, and it was such a beautiful ceremony. Wonderful, wonderful ceremony. And so we wanted to celebrate that on Sunday morning. So we came in here, we had a, a video, we kind of showed some of that. And, and we're going through a study right now. It's called The Story. We're going through a book. We're doing this church-wide. This is 31 chapters in this book that walks through the Bible in a chronological order. And it stays with the, the main walk through Scripture. And the idea is we're trying to become a more biblically literate church. So we know what's in the Bible. So the Bible's not intimidating. We can open up the Bible and know what we're looking at. And, and understand it a little better. Well, this was such a huge week and such a powerful week last week that we kind of we stepped aside from the story for just one week to talk about baptisms, to talk about the core of the gospel, to say what is it exactly that we receive our salvation from. And so we talked about it had nothing to do with us, had nothing to do with how we act and, and how good we are or the things that we've done. It all depended upon Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Um, now we had a, a baptismal pool set up, up over here on the side because after seeing what happened Saturday and after hearing the message, then we wanted people to have the opportunity to be baptized if they wanted. And so at the end of that service, we had two people, three people step forward and say uh, they wanted to be baptized. So they came forward in their service, and they were baptized, and it was a, a beautiful thing. Step, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see somebody who had no intention of being baptized to say, you know what, Jesus is more important than my nice Sunday clothes that I've got on, and I'm going to step forward, and I'm going to be baptized anyway, and, and to come forward and do that. And then after we closed out the service, uh, two more people came up and said, y- you know, I, I, I want to be baptized. And so we still had a, a crowd around here, and I don't know if you, if you were here, if you, if, you, if you saw that, but we had two more people come up after service and were baptized. Now what most of you don't know, a lot of you saw that, but what a lot of you don't know is that after that we cleaned up and we were just so happy, we were excited, and we, we emptied out the, the baptismal pool, and, and then my wife and I and my kids, and you know, we, we went over to, to Skyline and we sat down and we were just in awe of everything God had done that day, and we were just so excited, and my phone rings, and I answer my phone, and somebody says, my daughter wants to be baptized. <laughs> We're back at the church. We rushed back here after lunch because we talked about it. We rushed back here. We wanted to get baptized. Can we get baptized? I said, we've already emptied the pool, but come to Skyline. So they came there and we talked for a minute. We said, okay. And so we ran over to somebody's house that's got a pool in her backyard and we baptized another person that day. And by the way, if you were baptized uh, any one of those times last week, I, I've got a, if you haven't picked it up yet, we've got a baptism certificate for you, okay? So, uh, so I don't forget, if you, if you were baptized, uh, grab a hold of that before you leave today. But what a, a beautiful weekend. It was a, such a beautiful weekend, and just the way that God moved was, was spectacular. It was beyond anything that any one of us, or all of us together, could have planned outside of, uh, of, of just the work of God. And it was beautiful, beautiful. But what that does is that puts us in a stance today 
Okay, that puts us in a stance after a week like last week because I dare to say that, that the people who didn't get baptized, a lot of those people who've already been baptized, I, I feel like there was a recommitment to a lot of people. That, well, I've already been baptized, but, but seeing this fresh and anew and seeing all this, I, 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 it stoked the fires of passion within me and I am recommitting my life to Christ. And, and so today, we get to that point with, with new believers, with people who are, are, are recently committing their lives to Christ, and people who are recommitting their lives to Christ, the question comes up of, now what? Now what? I, I, I've made my declaration and, and my faith in Christ. Now what do I do? So I want to talk about that today, and let's, let's start in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, We've declared our love and our devotion to you in a public way. We've done it through through baptism. We have done it through recommitment. We've done it through remembrance ceremony of, of our baptism. Lord, we've done it in our, in our prayers. We have, we have come to you in a way to say, Lord, we are completely devoted to you. We trust you. Lord, we want to, to live a life that pleases you. So Lord, we ask now that you would speak into our lives, into our hearts, that you speak to us through the pages of your, your scripture, and tell us, Lord, now, what is the next step for us to do in this journey, in this walk towards you? We thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, again, uh, talk to you a little bit about the story. We're going through this story, and we are actually on chapter 25 this week. And if you've missed the first 24 chapters, don't worry about it, because each chapter stands on its own. And uh, we can certainly take a look into Scripture at any point and learn something. And so this week we're on a chapter 25, and this chapter is called Jesus, Son of God. So we're into the New Testament, we're into the latter portion of the ministry of Jesus, and this chapter leads us from uh, like the midpoint of his ministry up and through the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his final week before he's crucified. Now, everybody's doing this book uh, uh, church-wide. We do this in here as our service on Sunday morning, and the children in the back in the classrooms are talking about the same thing that we're talking about this week. And uh, so if you leave church today and you want to sit down with your kids and ask them what did they learn about, uh, they should be on the same chapter, although I'm going to put a small little addendum in there that possibly because of last week we might have got thrown off one week, but if that happened then we'll be resynced next week. Well, I'll be on the same page again. So if you ask them and don't shout that I'm a liar in the middle of Skyline or something like that, but... Um, so we're all walking through this together. We're all going to understand the Bible uh, a little bit better. And uh, in, in talking about Jesus, the Son of God, I have a video clip that I want to share with you that lays forth this idea. Okay, And this is from a movie called uh, A Knight's Tale. Okay, and, and please, when I show a video clip, I'm not necessarily promoting any movie in any way, shape, or form, but I, I want to promote this idea that is shown in this clip. And what happens is this is a, a, a guy who's a squire. Okay, He's a nobody, and, and he turns out he's really good at jousting. Well, he lies about who he is, and so he can get into jousting tournaments. And so he starts winning all these tournaments because he's really good. And then he falls in love with the, with the girl. And so this is an encounter that he's going to have with the girl before one of his jousting tournaments. Okay. Now, we can watch that, and we can understand her request for devotion from him. We can get it in this context and we can see, oh, well, well, she wants him to act against his nature in order to honor her. She wants him to, to deny what comes naturally to him and so that she can be the one who's, who's lifted up. Sacrifice his own name and his own honor and his own reputation in order to honor hers. We can see that clear in a, in a picture like this and understand it. So what does that idea, that concept have in common with this week's chapter of Jesus, Son of God? What does that radical reversal have to do? And that's kind of what I want to key off of this week is radical reversal. Now, at New Hope, we have a, a mission statement, and our mission statement is to develop it, our developing fully devoted Christ followers. 
Okay, this is, uh, this is not something we came up with. We pulled it out of Scripture. Okay, we're just uh, clinging on to that. But that is our goal. We want anybody who comes into New Hope, this is to be a journey for us to become, all of us, to become fully devoted Christ followers. Now, we talked last week, if you saw the video, about what is a Christ follower. And a Christ follower is someone who, who listens to Jesus and who, who listens to his teachings, who follows in his footsteps, is one of the phrases that was used. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the, the, the idea of following in his footsteps, and, and we need to be very careful, because let me step back again, because... Our faith in Jesus Christ, period, is what saves us. Okay? Our faith in what He did for us is what saves us. It is not what you do. It's our faith in Him that saves us. Then we go out and we are obedient and we live a life that honors Him of appreciation. It doesn't earn us anything. So, following in His footsteps then, after we have put our faith in Him, that becomes the, this, this next part of what we do, this next step of what, how we go forward in following Christ. And, and sometimes people, they want to look at the Bible and they want to set the Bible aside and they say, well, that's all open for interpretation. And it, that's such a cop-out. Okay, I just want to say that first of all. But it's specifically about this word of following Jesus when, when we say that, oh, you're supposed to follow Jesus. And somebody goes, well, that's open for interpretation. There's no interpretation for following us. Okay, it's not, he, doesn't, he doesn't mix words with this. Okay, you want to look up the Greek word for follow? It means follow. Okay, walk the same road. Okay, do the same things. There's not a whole lot of leeway there. So when we're going to be Christ followers, he's very clear about what that means. So radical reversal. Now Jesus tells us a lot of things in Scripture, and He tells us that, that, that in fact, there's a, a scene in Scripture in this chapter when Jesus goes up on a hill, He's with Peter, James, and John, and He's transfigured. He becomes this glorious light, and the interesting thing is that God then speaks from the heavens to James, and Peter, and John, and He says, Hey, this is My Son. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. Now, we live in a world where uh, we're all familiar with the phrase of, do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say, not as I do. We're all familiar with that phrase, unfortunately, because we, we've experienced that. We know people who tell us, do as I say, not as I do. And God shows up and says, listen to him. Well, we certainly should listen to Jesus. But let's look at what Jesus does. And does his words and his actions, do they match up? Do they, do they, do they uh, complement one another? And when we say, follow Jesus, can we confidently say, let's follow what He does and let's follow His words? I just want to look at two instances in Jesus' life. Two things that happen in His life. There's hundreds of encounters, but I want to look at two that are in this chapter 25. And the first one comes out of uh, Matthew chapter 19. And this is a, a scene where Jesus has large crowds gathering around him. He's in this, this area called Judea, and he's got all these people gathering him around him, and, and he's healing people. And then all of a sudden, the Pharisees show up. Now, if you don't know what a Pharisee is, a Pharisee is a, is a leader in this culture, okay? And now he, he, he's a, a religious leader and a political leader. And he, he's got all this, this clout that he carries with him. And so when you've got a large crowd of people that have gathered around Jesus and, and they're all clamoring for his attention and the Pharisees walk up, everyone else steps back. You give room for the Pharisees. Okay, these are the men who are important in this culture. These are the men that, that when they speak, everybody else shuts up and they listen. And so the Pharisees step up and they want to talk to Jesus. And they're talking to Jesus and they're asking him some questions and they're, and they're trying to catch him in some, something and they can trick him on. And, and in the middle of this encounter, when the entire crowd has stopped because the Pharisees have entered in, we see this line in Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 13. It says, Then some children were brought to him, brought to Jesus, so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. The disciples rebuked the children. I mean, he's talking to Pharisees. Okay, the children are supposed to be a peripheral thing. They're supposed to respect their elders. 
it's important to teach them, but they're supposed to be on the outside of the circle. They're not supposed to be the center of attention. They're certainly not supposed to interrupt a Pharisee. And so when, when the Pharisees have the floor and these children come into the middle of this to kind of interrupt, it's interesting that we take a look and see and ask the question, how does Jesus respond to this? How does Jesus respond to this interruption? Now, it's in Jesus' best interest to tell the children to wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. Step aside. We're having an adult talk here. Okay? Because the Pharisees, again, these were the, the influential men in society. These were the ones who, who could make or break Jesus, so to speak. If Jesus could win them over, then he would have won the crowds over. He could have talked to the Pharisees and got on their good side. Then everything would have been, went well for Jesus. People would have begun to listen to him. There wouldn't have been this, this uh, tension between Jesus and the, the religious organization. And so it would have been very much in his um, best interest at this point to prove his worth, his place, his mission. If he had the favor of these leaders... So we're talking about a, Jesus has an opportunity to receive the favor of the leaders here. And before we go into and talk about uh, what Jesus responded to, he, how he re, culturally or how he responded to these these people in culture who were unimportant, the children who were unimportant in this situation, quote unquote unimportant, then I want to look at another situation. This one comes out of Matthew 21. And this occurs in Jesus' final week. It's an interesting thing because Jesus rides into town, and we all know we've heard of the triumphal entry. He rides into town on a donkey. The crowds are just shouting Hosanna. They want to make him king. They're excited. They're happy. And so Jesus, what he does is he goes straight to the temple because this is a, a festival week. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people have gathered down uh, upon the city of Jerusalem, and he shows up. He's got everybody's attention. He goes to the center of this whole festival, which is the temple. He walks into the temple, and what we would expect Jesus to say is, Listen, I am so glad to be here. I'm here for you all. Let me tell you about the platform that I'm running on this week. And let me tell you the things I want. I'm here to promise you that I'm here for you. Okay, that's what we expect Jesus to do, but that's not what he did. Jesus walks in amidst all these crowd, amidst this, this festival, and Scripture in Matthew 21 tells us, And Jesus entered the temple, and he drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. So he doesn't come in schmoozing the crowd. He doesn't come in and say, I'm going to do what is in culturally my best interest in this situation. I'm not going to come in and, and please these people. I'm not going to come in and, and use the power that is and the popularity that is in my hands right now to boast myself. He came in and it's, it's pretty amazing because these people that he, he turned their tables over I mean, these are the coordinators of this event. Okay? These are the people who make this event happen. These are the people that if you're going to come to the temple and you're going to worship, you have to go through these money changers. You have to bring your, your, your money from uh, common commerce and you have to bring it up there and you have to exchange it for temple money so you can make temple offerings. If you're coming from a long way away, you, you show up and at, and at this market, you, you buy a dove so you can sacrifice it in the temple. Okay, they're making everything possible. These are the event sponsors. And Jesus comes in and he disperses them. He kicks them out. He, he, he turns over their tables. He said, you're taking this, this opportunity and you're making this a place where you, you are making money. It's supposed to be about the worship of God, but you're now turning this into a place where you're, you're making money. This has become a, a bizarre... Now, this is incredible in and of itself. Okay? It's incredible to see Jesus come in and, and, and against the, the expectation, we see him come in and, and turn these tables over. And there are some of us who might say, you know what? I've got no problem with that. 
I'm okay with Jesus coming in and, 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 and sticking it to the man, right? It's okay for him to go in and, and, and upset the establishment. But the next step is what's incredible in both of these instances. The next step is not just that he stood up to the politically powerful, not just that he stood up to the, the, the popular, but it's that he knelt down after that. That he, he stooped down to those who were unimportant. There's a radical reversal of what happened. God, God turned his back on, on the arrogant. God turned his back on the Pharisees. And we might say, so what? Okay, at the time, it was incredible, shocking, radical thing. And, and, and so God shows up uh, at, 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 and he tells the greedy, get out. And today we might, might not think that's a big deal, but that's a huge statement. But then what he does... It tells us in the story when the children interrupt the Pharisee. Jesus says, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me. But Jesus, the Pharisees were talking to you. The Pharisees have all the power, all the popularity. They have, they have everything that you need right there in the palm of their hand. And Jesus says, No, I'm going to turn away from, from all of that. And I'm going to focus on the unimportant. I'm going to focus on the little children. A radical reversal of what's important to him. And so Jesus empties the temple, and the scripture tells us that then, once he chased out all those who were buying and selling and all the money changers, it says the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. A radical reversal. The blind and the lame, they weren't allowed to come in with the temple and worship. And Jesus chases out all the ones who make it happen, all the ones who are making this festival happen, and then invites in the ones who have been shunned, the ones who are, are less than, the ones who are unimportant. This is, this is phenomenal. He, people telling Jesus... This isn't how you, you do it, Jesus. You know, the, if I was going to write your success strategy, this isn't what you want to do. This isn't the right way to go about this. If you want people to follow you, you, you don't go around and, and, and upset the car like this. You need to rub elbows with the rich and the famous and the popular and the powerful. Not the poor. Not the sick. Not the lame. You need to get into the, to the right circles with the movers and the shakers. Jesus had this radical reversal of, of what it is that, that everyone expected of him. And here's our first step. After you've stated a commitment in Jesus Christ and you've, you've put your faith in him and you've put your trust in him, then your first step is to say, I, I need to examine my life now and I need, to, I need to follow in those footsteps of radical reversal. That's one of the first things I need to do. I need to, to look at everything that's going on in my life. And like this, this movie clip, she calls them to be a loser. Step away from the things that you think are going to make you popular, that you think are going to make you great. All the things that you say that it's all about you and, and step away from that. Don't focus on that. Okay? Your focus now is to be on God. And then sometimes, in some instances, in some places... That means that you're going to be, in society's eyes, the loser. You're going to be the unimportant. You're going to be the unpopular. You know, we, we uh, tend to take Jesus and we, we tend to make Jesus an addition to our life. We tend to take Jesus and say that uh, I'm going to include him now in my life because uh, he, can, he can help me get everything that I want. 
if you've ever played video games, I, I haven't played them for years, but I know years ago they used to always have that button on the side. You know, when you get in big danger and, and you know, if you're racing cars and you're way behind, you can hit that power boost button over on the side and, and it shoots you forward, right? Anybody ever played that? Or, or, or you're, you're playing these fighting games and you got 57 people coming at you, you can hit the atomic bomb button and it wipes them all out. We think that Jesus is like that. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for where I'm gonna go war. I'm gonna I'm gonna head in the direction that I want to go. I, okay, I'm gonna go for all the things that I want to go for. And when I get into trouble, I'm gonna turn and hit the Jesus button, and He's gonna help me propel me towards my goal. And so we've just taken Jesus and we've added him onto our Batman utility belt as one of these tools that when we get in trouble, I'm gonna pull him out. I'm gonna pull out my Jesus boomerang, and everything is gonna be fine. But the, the truth is, and the truth is sometimes too, we take Scripture and we take the Bible and we use the Bible and we try to back up this idea. We, 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 we quote the Bible because we say, oh, well, well, God says, with Him I can do anything. And, and that's true, but that's taking it out of context. Because when He's talking about you can do anything, He's not talking about you can do anything for you for your benefit, for your popularity, for your wealth, for your pleasure, for your comfort. You can do anything for Him. For His glory. Now, sometimes we'll even say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, I'm going to continue heading in the same direction and now I'm just going to say that, that all these things that I want that I'm doing, they're for Jesus now. And we think that makes it okay. We think, well, well, yeah, my life has changed now because all these things that I'm heading for, it, we add on for Jesus at the end and we think that legitimizes everything that we're doing. You know, we'll say, um, uh, you know, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 25. I want to own a summer home in the Bahamas. I'm going to drive a sports car and I want to be famous for Jesus. Or we say, I, you know, I want to be comfortable. I'm going to sit on my couch. I want to have another beer and I want to watch the game. For Jesus. <laughs> I will say, I'm going to go buy a new outfit uh, on sale, of course, so I look good. For Jesus. And so we think that if we continue in this same pattern and we just tack on for Jesus at the end, then everything is okay. But it's not about that. A commitment to Jesus is about an all out about face. Now, I'm going to pause here because I'm going to tell you what some of you are hearing me say. Some of you are hearing me say that, that money and houses and cars and beer and sports and nice clothes are bad. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that any, any of those things are, are bad and they're, they're, they're things. Okay? What I'm saying is that the place that they take in our hearts, that's the problem. And, and here's the problem. is because I've said now that those things aren't bad, now you're going, oh, okay, now it's okay that I do that. But we need to ask some questions of ourselves and we need to, to inventory where those things are in our hearts. What place do they take in our hearts? Because they shouldn't be holding a place that God should be holding. I'm going to stand before you and I want to confess to you my apathy. I hate my apathy. I hate it. I so desire to have a heart like Jesus. I so want a heart that says that I care more about a hurting person than I do about my own comfort, than I do about my own couch, than I do about my own bank account. That I, I so want a heart that says, I don't care about all those things if I see a hurting person that should jump to the top of my list every time. Every time. But when we take our lives and we just add Jesus instead of doing a radical reversal, then these are the, the problems that we, we deal with and we battle with. It's, I dream of a time, I dream of a I dream of a time and a place. I dream of a time and a place when 30,000 people will gather 
not because uh, some uh, Billboard's top 10 artist is playing in an arena their music. Not when, not when 30,000 people gather to hear some political person uh, espouse their beliefs on how to fix the economy. Not when 30,000 people will gather for, for a sporting event that revolves around a ball of some sort. I dream of a time when 30,000 people will leave their homes and come out in droves because one person is hurting. The one person is lonely because one person is hungry. Every one of us, and myself at the top of the list, need to inventory our hearts, our apathy, our priorities, our faith in God, our commitment to God. What does that mean? Is it producing, is it producing a, a radical reversal in us? So the answer to the question of, of now what? Now that we've recommitted, now that we've committed, now that we've been baptized, now that we've made it a public declaration, the, the answer is radical, radical reversal. We have to change the way that we think about about people and things because things should never trump people. And the term unimportant should never apply to a person. Do we value things over people? Do we value power? Or do we value the needy? Do we hold up the popular or do we kneel down to those who are less than? And it's not a, this isn't a new problem. Another complaint people have is, oh, the, the Bible's antiquated. It's too old. It's not relevant anymore. Well, Scripture tells us in John chapter 12 they had the same problem. It says, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. That's what we struggle with today. We love human praise more than praise from God. So it's important to be seen in the right circles, in the right clothes, in the right car, in the right house, in the right neighborhood. Instead of the things that, that please God. It's not about those things. Don't hear me say it's about things. It's about your heart. Lord, we thank you that you are um, a radical God. That you that you came down and and you you just shook up this world in such a way that that Lord, we've been talking about you ever since. And Lord, we won't stop talking about you. And, and one day you're going to return to this, this earth and you're going to lead this world and you're going to be our king here on earth, Lord. And we, we, we look forward to that day. And in the meantime, Lord, we want to prepare this kingdom for you. We want to be uh, people that, that shine your light on this world around us, Lord. And, and we want to do it in a loving way, in a humble way. We don't want to go out and, and, and do battle with anyone. We want to, to, on our knees, Lord, serve those around us and so that we can show them the loving God that you are. We want to love those people who are, are quote-unquote unimportant. We want to look around us and the people who are ignored, we want to pay attention to them. The people who are hurting, we want to help them heal. The people who are lonely, Lord, we want to sit and talk with them. The people who are hungry, Lord, help us to feed them. Father, we... We know that this isn't the way of the world and isn't the way to necessarily gain us popularity or, or money or, or fame or, or power. But those things are not, are not important to us. It's simply you and what you've done for us. And we thank you and pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.